Welcome to Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75, a series by the Planetary Podcast. In Common Home Conversations, you will hear from leading global experts on how the proposal of recognizing the existence of an intangible global common without borders can change our relationship with our planet. The Common Home of Humanity has proposed an ambitious new global pact for the environment. The adverse effects of climate change span across borders and beyond territories. Recognizing the Earth system as a common heritage of humankind is the first step in restoring a stable climate, a visible manifestation of a well-functioning Earth system. This proposal's cascading effects would be systemic and tremendously impact international relations and economics, opening the doors to restoring a well-functioning Earth system. Common Home Conversations is the place to discuss a new social contract between society, economy, and the Earth system. Now, here is your host, founder and CEO of the Planetary Press, Kimberly White. Hello, and welcome to Common Home Conversations. Today, we are joined by Hindu Ibrahim, founder and president of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. Hindu is also the co-chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and a UN SDG advocate. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. You have been a steadfast champion for human rights and sustainable development. What was the inspiration behind your lifelong dedication to bettering our planet? Yeah, I mean, I'm so excited to championing uh, a sustainable development goals because uh, for me, they are talking about our life. So when we take from the objective one, who is the fighting poverty, or to the five, who is the gender, or 13, who is climate change, and now uh, all the 17 of them to take us in the partnership, they are talking about how we can improve our life, how we can improve our society, and how we can make it better than now by respecting people's and climate. So for me, it is obvious because from uh, the communities that I come from, we always take all the problems and all the uh, crises together in order to resolve all of them. So that's why I am so excited to championing the sustainable development goals for my peoples and for all indigenous peoples and at the end of the day for the planet in general. So we're seeing how climate change is impacting every corner of our planet in many ways. Can you share with us how climate change is affecting your country and your region? So I am coming from uh, Sahel regions and coming from uh, a Chad who have a three different landscape. Uh, we have 100% desert in the north and uh, we have savanna and Sahel in the uh, middle and then we have the tropical forest that the Congo Basin in the south. So when you live in the three different ecosystems in a landlock uh, and when your life is depend from the uh, ecosystem, you know exactly the impact of the climate change. You do not read it in the book or watch it in the TV. You leave it. And uh, I give you the example of how we are really impacted. Uh, we get a research from my organization from 99 to now. Chat is already on plus 1.5 degree increase. And why? We see that every day. Our dry season become much longer with a very, very long sun and heavy sun that's coming up to 50 degrees Celsius. When you go to the desert, it's about 54 degrees Celsius. And that impact our environment. It's impact the rain because the rain season also changed. It's become much shorter and coming with the heavy rain that can flood all the places, for example, this year where we have all the Sahara is on the flood. You have even in the towns, people take the canoe to go from one neighborhood to another one. And four months before, it was the heat and the very dry heat where the crops cannot grow up. And it will end up with the food insecurity because when you don't have a regular rain, it cannot penetrate the soil, it cannot leave the vegetation to regenerate. And that impact the food insecurity of the communities. And at the end of the day, the environmental impact, it's go change the social life of the peoples. 
it creates conflict among the communities that fighting to get access to the shrinking resources. And one of the example I uh, give, it's uh, around the Lake Chad. Lake Chad is the fifth bigger fresh water that we do have. Around this lake in 1960, it was 25,000 kilometers square of this fresh water. Shared between uh, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, and Central African Republic. And now the lake is shrinking to 2,000 kilometers square of fresh water. So you have 90% of the water just evaporated because of the heat. And suddenly there is more than 50 million now people who are living and depending from this fragile ecosystem. They are farmers, they are fishermen, and pastoralists from my community. So what those people have to do, because they don't depend from the end of the month salaries, they depend from the rainfall, they depend from the uh, ecosystem of this area of lake. So just uh, they fight among themselves to get access to those resources. Some of them become a internal displaced, others become a refugee, and then uh, most of them, of especially the youth, become a migrant cross border and then maybe cross the oceans. So the climate is impacting all the single step of our life and development. One of the most powerful change agents overlooked throughout society is women. Studies have shown that women are disproportionately impacted by climate change. According to the United Nations, 21.5 million people are displaced annually by weather hazards worsened by climate change. And out of those displaced, women account for 80%. How are women critical in the fight against the climate crisis? Uh, sure. I mean, women are the front line of the climate change impact. Because when uh, the weather change, maybe it is the weather for people, uh, ordinary peoples. But for the peoples who depend on these resources, it is the life who is changing, and especially the women. Because in our communities, women are the ones who are responsible of feeding the communities. So they, uh, they are the ones who, of course, collecting the water, the wood, but collecting also the traditional medicine and collecting the food from the brooch. So during the rain season, we collect all the fruits and all the vegetables that we do have. Then they dry them up in order to use them during the dry season for the entire season. But there is no enough for everyone in it. So they found themselves that fighting to just to get access to those resources who call it food. It is the livelihood for us. And uh, in, in the other hand, when uh, there is uh, a dry season and there are not enough resources, the man responding by going away. So when they leave the places, they leave the women and the children behind who have to fight for them daily best in order to cope and get adapt and found the food for them families. So they are really the most vulnerable. And of course, they cannot maybe migrate a long path. And when there is a crisis that come, like around Lake Chad, when there is the shrinking of the resources, it's helping also the terrorist group to get settled there like Boko Haram. And then the violence is start in those places. And the women and children have to take them children and leave the place. At the end, they become a, uh, internal displaced or migrant in their own homeland from one region to another one. And then they become the most vulnerable again. It is uh, not the issue of that they are climate refugee or whatever, but they are really an internal migrant. They are internal refugees in their own home countries, not because of the economic reason, but because of the environment that degraded and they cannot get any access as they used to, to get food and medicine for them children and ensure the generations. That really shows how interconnected everything is the environment, social issues, and security. Yes, of course. I mean, that's why for us, we cannot talk on all those crises in silo. 
because when we talk about the uh, the uh, insecurity, they talk about the uh, rebellion groups or or uh, terrorist group that taking the opportunity. They taking the opportunity because they found the people who are already poor, and then they increase this poverty every day with the climate change, and they take the opportunities to steal what they have, them dignity. And if a person do not have a dignity in these communities, so they are ready to do everything in it and or they are forced to just to have two choices. They join them or they become a migrant running from this place to go to another place. And when they go to another place, there is no enough work for everyone and they become again the most vulnerable. So insecurity, climate change, poverty, lack of development, all those issues are interlinkages. We cannot respond to the insecurity as just to giving a gun and then uh, having a soldiers around if we do not work around the development of the communities. And we cannot also wait until the crisis come and respond as humanitarian, giving the food aids and does it. So it is not also the sustainable way. The three pillars work together. The, the security issues, the development issues, and then the humanitarian issues, all those need to be in the same level in order to help the people go out from the all the impact of and the insecurity that they have. Then in the top, we have all to fight the climate change in order to give the future to those communities. You make an excellent point. Globally, we've discussed many of these issues in their respective silos. However, as we can see throughout the world and in your region, these issues are all interconnected. So it is imperative that we take this into account when developing plans of action and solutions. Can you discuss the importance of preserving and sharing traditional knowledge and its role in helping current science and technology provide solutions to the climate and biodiversity crises? So while in uh, in indigenous communities, in uh, many indigenous communities, are, or I can say all indigenous communities that depend from the nature, and I give you the example of my own peoples, that we depend from the rainfall. We live from one place to another one to found water and pastures. And that gives us the unique opportunity to live in harmony with our ecosystem, to understand the nature to live with this nature for centuries and thousands of years. So we learn from each species of the nature, from the cloud, from the wind, from all the insects, flowers, plants, our own cattle who give us a lot of information. And from all those when we build our traditional knowledge, we build our wisdom. And that help us to build our resilience. But the traditional knowledge are also ecosystem best. I give you the examples like when we come to the Western knowledge, they say, oh, in the Sahel, you have like three seasons, uh, one rain season, dry season, and then uh, maybe cold season that is disappearing because of the climate change. But in our communities, like the peoples who are living between the Sahara and the savannas, there are six seasons. Those who are living between savannas and tropical forests, there are seven seasons. And all those seasons are based on each ecosystem we have. And it's helped us to develop a unique traditional knowledge to get adapt and build our resilience to all the climate change. And the knowledge that we do have also are oral because they are very old knowledge. They are centuries of knowledges. And then we can use them if we respect them, we understand them, and we give them the same level of recognition as science knowledge. We cannot have the science who can confirm the traditional knowledge. It cannot work like that. Science cannot confirm it because indigenous people's traditional knowledge are since thousands of years, and science knowledge has discovered after that. So it is no way that they confirm because they just don't know how to write, how to read. And they do not know how to read our languages or how to write our languages. And our language play a big role in our knowledge. So that's why it is important to work hand by hand science knowledge and traditional knowledge in order to empower each other and then to get support to build the resilience for the peoples. Not to make a report, but to build a resilience for the peoples. 
I recently saw a quote about how we look at nature-based solutions now like they're this new thing. But indigenous communities had the original nature-based solutions. They've been saying these things for centuries. Exactly. I mean, when the people discover the new world, that's also what I'm saying. All the climate change movement, they love a new wording. Each year, there is a new word. That, so it is not having a sexy word that can resolve the climate issues. It is understanding what is happening that can help us resolve it. When they say, oh, nature-based solution can add a 30% of uh, the solution to the climate change, we are like, well, that's what we are trying to tell you for many years. We are trying to tell you that our nature play a big role to restore all the ecosystem and to have a solution for the climate change. And the nature-based solution, they are calling it, for us, it's our way of life. It's our way of living. And when, like my community as nomadic, they live from one place to another one all the time, our, uh, our cows help to fertile the land. And when we come back, we found the water and pastures. So this is the nature of solutions because it's created in a natural way, in this circular way that we respect the environment and environment give us in return also what we need, food, medicine, and uh, all uh, the necessary for our survival. The sad part of it, uh, they wanted to put, to put a price on a nature-based solutions. Nature is not a business. We cannot put a price in a nature. If we ask someone that how much you cost yourself, they are like, why we are putting a price in, uh, in the people? So, okay, nature also has a right. We cannot put a price as money, as cash in a nature. We have to put our wisdom. We have to know how we can live in harmony with this nature. And that also called a nature-based solutions. So they need to understand the wisdom of uh, living in harmony with the nature in order to give this nature break to build a resilience for all of us and to take all the planet in the level that we want on 1.5 degree. Absolutely. Our lives and our livelihoods depend on nature. It's the most valuable thing that we have. And that's why it's so important that we work towards these goals together. Now, you're the founder of AFPAT. Can you tell us more about this and how the coalition is working to empower indigenous communities? Yes, I found the AFPAT, who is the Indigenous Women and People's Association of Chad, when I was very young. Actually, I found it when I uh, finished the primary school. And then it's get the official authorization when I get 15 years old. And the reason that for me, it's how I can fight for the rights of the girls who have my age at that time and who do not have uh, all the right that they deserve. And I understood that I cannot talk about the human rights without talking about environment rights because in my communities, uh, all is the same. Human rights and environment rights are the same. If you violate the right of environment, you are violating the right of the human being that living there. And that have been our two objectives. A protection and promotion of human rights and indigenous people rights and protection of environment through the three Rio conventions, climate change, biodiversity and desertifications. So uh, when we have those objectives for us, it is how we can make a concrete action to the communities, how we can empower women and girls, how we can work with the communities to, to make them understand about what is happening at the international level and take also the needs of the communities to the international level in order to take a right decisions. So how we can build all this bridge between the two different worlds. We did many activities. So empowering women, it's one of them. So giving the women the revenue. For example, we did an activities that uh, help the women to transform the product that they have in their hands. So uh, some of them have only the small mills that they planted by the hand, they transform it by the hand. There was nothing in all this process that support them. Everything is doing by hands. And then that takes them a lot of time, especially during this climate change impact, because they do not have any time for themselves 
to manage between uh, ha having water or having food or going to transform the meals that they will feed them families. So they are the one who will uh, waking up very early morning and sleeping the last. So for us, it is very important to help them develop the activities that help them to mitigate all the suffering that they do have. So we give them some training and some machine that help them to transform these meals. And when they did that, so they own a lot of revenue, they own time, and it's helped them to use the revenue that they have to even put them children to school. It was a dream for so many years. So it's uh, helping them to get adapt to the climate change, helping them to build the resilience with all the projects that we are giving them. On in another hand, we work with all the community in the land rights because it is very important that we are talking about the natural solution, talking about climate change and environment degradation and all. But we do not talk about land. Because if you don't have land, you have nothing. And that sent me to the point where there is like a World Bank who uh, elaborate the level of poverty. They say if you live uh, now is increasing below $5 a day, you are called a poor. So I say no. When you come to my community, you can have your $5. If you have nothing to buy with it, you are called poor. But if you have a land, you are not poor. Because the land can produce for you something. So that's helped us to work on the land rights. And we create a 3D participatory mapping, who is a model that help the communities who didn't went to school to come together with the science, science knowledge, build the map, figure out the traditional knowledge, help to map where are the corridors, where are the water points, and how they can better manage the natural resources that they have for the long way and how they can mitigate also the conflict that they have with the communities. And this 3D participatory mapping in a pastoral uh, land, in, then in a very big area, it's just like the first one we did. And it's really worked well. It's give the government the, uh, the uh, chance to say, oh, if there is an organization like AFPAT who did uh, this uh, uh, mapping, so as government, we can do more. And it's helped them to take a decision to reopen 60,000 kilometers of corridors. They start doing it. They, then the project was funded by the uh, African Development Bank. So it's ending up like in a good advocacy for us. So we also did like uh, education is very important for us, but education that can respect the needs of the communities who cannot just talk, come and dictate what the peoples can do, like history of France or of US or whatever, but who can help how the communities can manage better the resources, how they can know how to count, how they can uh, just like integrate themselves in the new development pathway that we are having. So this project also it's ha have been very important for us in helping the women and girls also to think about the school is not only for the boys, but it's very important for all the uh, peoples equally, including the young women. So, I mean, we have a lot of projects. We have uh, uh, others going on. We work on the COVID, of course, because it is uh, uh, the time that it's happening and we cannot leave our communities behind. So we start seeing how we can design a better model for them to help them understanding what is happening because COVID, it is not a old thing that everyone know. It is a new thing with a lot of barriers that coming from the languages, from like you need to wash your hands and people who do not have clean water to drink, they cannot wash them hand. They cannot get this access. So we try to help on how they can get the access at least to protect themselves and how we can build also our own governance system to reinforce our uh, our knowledge, our elders, to protect them from all what is happening. And from this one, we work at the international level where we do the advocacy on climate change, on biodiversity, on the certification convention and on human rights to help that the decision making to do not leave behind the voice of our communities. So we show them the evidence of the project that we do on the ground and then we refuse that they take the decision that exclude or harm our peoples back home. But it is not the easy task because they are not listening always. 
I can't even begin to fathom how difficult it has been with COVID-19 for these communities. It has been difficult here in the United States, and the people here have more access to things like clean water and PPE. As far as governments not always listening, I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to around the world, especially when it comes to climate change. We're seeing climate denial here in the U.S., Australia, Brazil. What you're doing at AFPAT is amazing. A great example of embracing sustainable development. Speaking of, you were named a UN SDG advocate. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role and what you've been doing with that? Yeah, I mean, actually, I'm so proud and uh, happy to be among the uh, 17 SDG advocates. So the Sustainable Development Goals design the life of uh, all of all of us in a same way it's adopted by all the un countries and uh, why i accept to be an advocate it's to give the access to those who are left behind because so one thing about sdgs it is leaving no one behind and if we don't want to leave no one behind we have to include the peoples that left behind to be in, in the tables of decision making and then to say if the things are not working and then to say how they think that the things should be work. So that's why I am in the SDG advocate and I'm carrying the voice of uh, uh, my people, but of all the other indigenous peoples around the world, how we are seeing the development, how we are seeing the sustainability and how it should work. It's give me the opportunity to talk with head of state, with many people that are uh, decision makers and telling them that you cannot take the decision anymore without including our people, without including our voices. It has to be us. And uh, another thing for me about SDGs, it's how we can localize SDGs. We cannot only talk about them at the international level and ask the government to go and uh, report back and monitor and say we did that, we, ha- we are in this level. So it has to be localized. It has to be inclusive. It has to be that uh, the, the SDGs talking about peoples and about planet. And that is all what I'm fighting for it for all my life. We cannot talk about peoples without planet. We cannot talk about planet without peoples, how we can make it a people's uh, center of all the decision making. So that's uh, why like being an SDG advocate, it's give me the, the opportunity to defense and then give the ideas of how as indigenous peoples we think that the SDGs can be implemented and how it can be fear and leaving no one behind and include everyone in it. And now we have only 10 years. So this decade, we have to work very hard, all of us, to make the SDGs real. And I think there is an opportunity around the world when we start including all the peoples and then we can make the SDGs localized and we can make them happen. Absolutely. It is a make or break moment for sure with climate change. We need all hands on deck from the individual to the indigenous communities, to the business, to the local government, to the national government. We need everyone because this is truly a problem that affects everyone. So it's essential that everyone is included in that discussion. So during these unprecedented times with COVID-19, the biodiversity crises, and the climate crisis, do you believe change at the global level is possible? And what should be the role of a new global pact for the environment? The change is possible. The change is possible because the world show us overnight how the COVID-19 come and change the life in general. So if we all agree that we can fight the COVID together, not in silo, so we do have the hope to fight all the rest of the crisis. So when COVID come, you know, all the countries that agree to lock down together, they agree to put the measures to protect the people's fears. But one thing they uh, they all agree on it is on the food shipping. So all of them open the borders to have the food. So they understand they are not autosufficient. They are not sovereign in the foods. So they need each other in order to ship this. And then it's also help people to understand that living in solidarity, it is very important. So then they start to understand that, oh, community is very important for all of us to act together. 
So that's give me the hope that we can act all globally. When we talk all on the same level, so it's coming to the same global action we are calling for, for all because health is part of the SDGs. And when we talk about the green recovery, it's mean that the climate, the biodiversity, the oceans, the water, all have to be in the centers. Also, it's coming back to the SDGs. So all those moments giving me more hope that world maybe finally can open their eyes and focus in the most urgent needs of our time. Focusing on peoples and planet, focusing on rebuilding the relationship with nature, focusing on restoring, living in harmony with the nature and learning from indigenous people's way of life on how we are doing it for centuries of life, centuries of years. So I think the hope is there. What is missing is a political will. What is missing is the action oriented. So we need the direct action to the communities, to those who are the most vulnerable, most impacted by all the crises. When it's come to climate or biodiversity or COVID, those who are the most vulnerable, indigenous peoples, women, children are always the front lines. The people with disability, of course, are always in front lines. So when we take action oriented to those communities who do not leave them behind, I think we can resolve all those global problems together. And we, we need also to, to do it by the political will. If the politicians is still thinking about how they can recover their own economy, they forget about we cannot have a sustainable economy without a green planet or without respecting the right of each of us, without uh, justice, inclusiveness, and no marginalization, so they cannot make it. So the political will need to be there to fight inequality, to fight injustice, to make the inclusiveness as reality. And then we can do it all together. And to fund this, they talk a lot about a lot of billions that they wanted to inject in the economy. But all what they are talking, they are making the same mistake. They want to inject those money on the big industry that exists already. Because for them, it is easy to monitor because they exist already. They have all the portfolio to welcome the billions that they wanted to give them and to re-inject it again and they make it the richer, again, much richer. They are creating a gap. So this political leadership need to change, to turn all those billions to give to those most vulnerable, to build them capacity to have the equity. We all saw the last report of the Oxfam on inequality. This report shows that the more richer are rich again two times than before because all the political leadership is giving them again more power, again more money, creating the gap between those who are the most vulnerable with those who are already rich. So this one needs to be turned down. It needs to be based on the equity and justice. So those two things, I really miss it. If we have them, we can tackle all the global crisis that we have. You're absolutely right. So how would recognizing our global commons help boost the much needed change we need to combat the climate crisis and other crises we are currently facing? So how we can give rights in the equal way to the oceans, to the waters, to the trees, and to the human being, and how we can respect each other. Our global common also is how we can share in the equitable way the resources that we have, how we can sustain them, and how we can call it the global commons because we all depend on it. I am coming from a landlocked country, but I am advocating also for the oceans. I am passionate about oceans. I want to just to see this ecosystem that we are impacting and try all my best to protect this ecosystem. So th this one, I'm calling it our global common, not only because you live on it directly or you depend on it directly that you have to protect it, but you need to protect it because it's creating in one or another way your life better. As well as uh, the glaciers, I'm always talking about my indigenous brothers and sisters from Arctic. 
And I went to the glaciers. I saw the glaciers with my eyes just to witness it and then to say there is no way that we destroy this ecosystem because it's playing a big role in all our life, even I'm not coming from Arctic. So this global common need to be understood by all the humanity that it is for all of us. If we destroy one of them, we destroy tropical forests, our life going to be destroyed. We destroy the ocean, our life will be destroyed. We destroy the savannas, the, the glaciers, our life going to destroy. It is our global common and we have all the duty to protect it. We come from it or we do not come from it. We have the duty to protect it and to respect it. So that's how I'm seeing we can pro we can all come together and uh, promote it and respect it. I have lived in Alaska and I've seen the glaciers melting and it's happening at a much faster rate than science initially anticipated. Seeing all of these ecosystem changes, you know, we're seeing how people are impacted and how the wildlife is impacted. It's just, it's crazy to see and it's very sad to see. So how do you think that proposal from the Common Home of Humanity, this global legal framework, will help initiatives like the Paris Agreement, a global deal for nature, and provide the foundation and create a system of accountancy? Yes, I mean, actually, uh, the Paris Agreements or the SDGs, so we decided together, I mean, countries come together and decide it, they clap it, they uh, endorse it, they sign it. But they need to implement it. So the, the time of advocating on doing all, it's finished. So they need to implement it. And to implement it, we need also another global uh, framework that to make, if you destroy the nature, you will be judged for this, this uh, destroyment. And then you have to be accountable on it. What will happen if you destroy it? Like if can, a country or a nation don't want to take the responsibility, what will happen? So the peoples need to act. If the government cannot act, so peoples must act to protect the rest of us. So it has to be people movement who can accompany all the implementation of the uh, global agreement that we do have. All right, and there you have it. We cannot talk about people without the planet, and we cannot talk about climate without people. It is time to open our eyes and focus on the most urgent needs of our time. Focus on people and the planet. It is our duty to protect and respect our global commons. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting green recovery efforts have shown us that change is possible. The legal framework proposed by the Common Home of Humanity would provide us with a way to recognize our global commons and create a system of accountancy, helping us to achieve the ambitious goals and targets needed to combat the climate crisis. That is all for today, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75. Please subscribe, share, and be sure to tune in next week to continue the conversation with our special guest, Prue Taylor, Deputy Director of the New Zealand Center for Environmental Law. And visit us at www.theplanetarypress.com for more episodes and the latest news in sustainability, climate change, and the environment.